All right, I think we are live. Uh, let us know in the comments if you can see and hear us. Um, Lindsay, the frugal crafter, here with Sarah today. Hi! And Sarah is going to be moderating the chat. She will, um, if you have a question for me, she will relay it to me. Just type the word question in all caps. Now, some questions have been asked a lot of times. And if that's the case, and our moderators, either Sarah or some of the other moderators in the group, know the answer, then they'll jump right in and answer it for you so you don't have to wait. So, um... As we're going along, if something occurs to you, if something's unclear, uh, then go ahead and ask us and uh, just keep the questions to watercolor so um, it'll make sense for the folks watching later at home on the replay. We're going to use Yarka watercolors today, but you can use whatever brand you want. And I'm just going to show you the different colors we're going to use. We're going to use a cool red, and this one is um, a Carmine Hue PR170. And um, it's just kind of like a cool pinky red, a cool color. We're going to use um, Cadmium Orange, which is Pigment Orange 36. We're going to use Cad Yellow Medium, which is PY35. It's a fairly neutral to almost a little cool yellow, actually. Uh, we have PG7, and uh, that's your Thalo Green. We have PB15, which is your Thalo Blue. And I was going to put a neutral in here, but I decided I didn't need it. And painting a loose painting, I didn't want to throw in a bunch of neutrals and have it encourage and encourage it to get muddied up. And the reason I put the pigment numbers in the video description as well as the names is because these are a, a Russian watercolor and their name, some of the names for their colors are not what you are accustomed to. They call this Russian green, but everybody else in the world would call it thalo green. And um, I think it's just a little easier if you have a more of a, either the pigment number or a common name to go by. We're also using mostly cool colors. Even though this is a cad yellow medium, it's still like neutral to almost cool. And our red and blue and green are cool. When you're doing a loose watercolor painting, uh, the cooler your colors, the less mud you'll get because uh, our warm colors tend to muddy things up. So just keep that in mind if you find you're getting way too much mud when you paint. Any questions yet, or are we doing good? Doing good. Okay, so we're going to sketch together, and I'm going to use a black marker on typing paper so that you can really see what um, what I'm sketching here. And I'm going to show you the reference photo, which I do have a, a, a download in the video description. And I do apologize if the focus readjusts now and then. I thought I clicked the do not autofocus button, but I hadn't, and I was already... Everything was already rolling and I couldn't go back and, and alter it. But this is what we're going to be um, sketching. If you prefer to print out the photo and trace it, go right ahead. Um, but we'll sketch it together. And if you like your sketch, then just transfer that to your watercolor paper. So uh, when I am sketching, I try to keep really basic lines. And it's helpful to sketch on paper that's not your watercolor paper if it's not something super simple. This isn't too difficult. So um, you probably could go right ahead and sketch it on your watercolor paper. I'm starting with the band on the mason jar. Uh, kind of coming out with a little shoulder on either side, straight line down. I'm sketching a little bit bigger than what our painting is. I always have, I always fill up a space. If my paper's bigger, I always sketch bigger. I'm going to round the bottom. Now here's a little trick. If you're worried that you've got a lopsided um, vase, turn it upside down and look at it. When you see it upside down, it'll be, uh, become very apparent what is off and then you can alter it. And you can make all kinds of crazy lines because you're gonna transfer this. When you're drawing daisies um, or black-eyed Susans or any sort of flower that has petals coming out of a center point, what I like to do is try to find like here, this flower right there. We have almost a full circle, but not quite. Lindsay, is it yeah. possible to put something solid down on the white paper because it's constantly Oh, auto maybe, yeah, maybe. What if I put that there with that? Let's see if that helps. It's, I think it's probably I mean, my. I'm still a little behind. So. It's probably my hand moving. I apologize, yeah, guys. I try to. With the white and the lines. It just. It's trying to like. Oh, I apologize. I hope this isn't a problem. I tried to go back and change it, but I'd already started my encoder and. Uh, Let's try not to move my hand much. Um, so I've got the center that looks kind of like a gumdrop. It's in the middle, and then I'm gonna put my petals out from that center. So you want to go. Kind of like points on a compass, and just fill in. So if you're painting along, this might be a little um, a little stressful to kind of catch up and, and sketch along, but you can always catch the replay to um, get your sketches in. And then for other ones, if it's not like a really big, uh, you know, not like this one's pretty much out flat. This guy right here is kind of like just a straight line across. I can just kind of throw in a few just loose petals. And you want to put as few lines as possible um, on this sketch because... 
um, we're going to be doing a lot of loose techniques and our where our paint splotches end up is going to determine a lot of our flower placement. And something very freeing about sketching with a marker. And then some thistle. Um, it's kind of like a teardrop, upside down teardrop shape with some spikies off of it. We're going to put a couple of thistles in there. I think that did help. I think putting that little uh, bottle there helped. Yeah, it did. it's helping quite a bit. Oh, good. Good suggestion. If we need to put something bigger in there, we can do that too. And oh, it seems to be holding pretty steady, so... Awesome. And then, of course, you can throw down a few little um, stems, but we're going to paint those in. So it's basically, you know, just get a quick sketch of a mason jar. And, I mean, you don't even have to pencil sketch it in if you don't want to. You could just go ahead and... Uh, and you know, sketch it in with paint if you if you feel confident about that. So the reason I wanted to do that with a marker, you can see how lightly I sketched it on my paper. It's not really dark, and I didn't want um, I didn't want it to uh, be frustrating if you couldn't see really kind of what I was doing. And I can put actually my final painting over here on the edge. When we do that, that might help the camera focus too. Let me just adjust. I apologize. Give me a minute here, guys. Just slide things over and adjust. Okay. I'll try to stand far. I should get long handled brushes for this so I don't get my <laughs> hands in the way. So I'm going to start off by splashing my paper with water. Hopefully not my paint, my other painting. And this is just going to give me some random bits of water that I can uh, work into. And I'm going to have a paper towel handy. I find paper towels do absorb a little bit better than, uh, than rags. And I'm going to start in with um, the vase here. And I think I'll maybe just wet a few other areas just to help the paint to flow in some areas where I want it. I'm going to mix my phthalo green and phthalo blue together. We're going to come up with this nice turquoise color. And I am going to add this here and there and just kind of let it bleed around. I'm going to show you a product called Bleed Proof White, which you can see it's keeping our focus on our painting right now. Um, for highlights, but if you don't want to use that, just make sure you leave a dry white space there. Maybe it's not, it's starting to, every time you move it, it's oh, trying to shoot. auto focus. <sighs> Can you shut the camera off for a second? Turn it off, or will that screw everything up? I think it, I think okay. it will screw everything up. Oh, shoot. It's always something, guys. It's, I'm sorry. Yeah, every time you, you're moving the brush, oh, not, but when you start to move the brush, it tries to auto focus. Oh, darn it. Well, we'll do our best, and uh, how many people do we have in? I wonder if I should just... 250. Yeah, gosh, I don't want to bail on it, because I might not be able to get everything back up in time. Throwing in a little bit of that yellow. I wonder, you know what? Maybe if I bring the painting up on something higher. Why don't I try that? Because... That might help, and then it can. Then I won't be doing anything higher than where the painting is. This ought to be interesting. Let's try putting that up there. Of course, now it's going to be smaller, but we can give that a try and see if that. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't think that's going to work because then I can't. My the palette's going to be out of focus, and everything else will be out of focus. Darn it! <laughs> um, I'm going to pull out a little bit of a shadow on the table here. Oh, by the way, this video is brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. You can find all the supplies that I'm using on their website. I'm going to add a little bit of that yellow into the, the uh, highlight in the water, too, on the table, just to give it a little bit of a glow, like the light is coming through it and uh, reflecting on the table. I'm trying to keep my hands out of frame as much as possible. And I'm going to go ahead and mix up some gray for the band there. And I am going to use a little bit of the red, um, the carmine hue. I'm going to add some of the phthalo blue to that. Make kind of a violet. And then I think I'm going to add some yellow. We'll see how that grays it up. Do a little bit more blue. And now it looks, uh, well, it's it's gray with a little bit of a green undertone, so I need just a smidgen more red. 
So you can always mix your grays, no matter what you have for colors, as long as you can um, make a color then make an opposite. All right, holding the end of my brush. So this is going to be extra loose because I'm holding my the end of my brush. And um, when you hold your end of your brush, you just are automatically looser. I'll scoot you down a little bit to keep my hand out of the shot. I just fill in the band area. All right, and we'll add a little bit of this into some of the uh, the jar as well because pretty much any color is reflected in glass when you're when you're working in um, something transparent like that and very reflective. You can even have some of that into your shadow. Now any of these colors can also be flicked into the background if you want. You just have to make sure you have enough paint and water to flick it. And actually I think I'd like to take a few of these colors and just flick them on fairly loosely. And it's got a nice big puddle of that red too. That's a pretty color. All right. So the thing about the Yarka watercolors is that they do tend to be quite um, vibrant and you do have to water them down quite a bit. Uh, otherwise they can overtake a painting pretty quickly. But I do want some of these splashy colors in the background. Yeah. Put that green in there. I do have to push my hand across the painting, so my apologies if it blurs. I could have sworn I hit that no autofocus button, but apparently I did not. And I'm trying to go around some of the yellow flowers, but I'm just trying to get a little something in the background. How's everyone coping out there and YouTube land with my hand in the shot? It seems to be good. Oh, good. And remember, your colors do dry lighter, especially if you're working really like in a wet, in wet situation so if you think it's a little bold it looks a little lighter on the monitor um, than what it does on my paper from what I'm seeing on my preview monitor so um, you're probably seeing about what it would look like dry if my colors and what your colors are, are the same don't worry if you drag something out into the background it's not gonna be a big deal um, some of these colors are staining your phthalo colors are very stainable so if you do change your mind, it's really going to be tough to lift this up. That's why I said you could use any color you want. I mean, any paper you want, because we're not really doing a lot of lifting here. We're going to let it do what it wants to do for the most part. Some of the gray up there. That's a nice color to flick on there, because we made that gray with cool colors, so it's not a real muddy gray. And I, I've heard people think or say that the Yarka colors are um, are really opaque, but I think they're so strong that by the time you dilute them to what you need, they're really not that opaque at all. And this paper I'm working on is Arches, which is a higher quality paper than what I did my sample on. So I'm very curious to see what, uh, what the difference will be when I go to compare them afterwards. All right. I just throw a little bit or drag a little bit of color into the center of my bouquet. So I don't have too many white spots around my flowers. And if you want blossoms and blooms, you can flick on some water and you'll get some interesting blooming happening. And then we're going to dry it. So if you have any questions while I'm drying, go ahead and ask them. I switched to my quieter dryer, so I did improve something. I didn't, didn't improve the focusing qualities, but I did remember to get my quiet dryer. So if you have questions, you'll actually be able to hear me answer them during the drying portions. Never done watercolor.
colors and I'm shopping for paints. None of the packages say phthalo blue, etc. How do I know what I'm getting? All right, Heather wants to know what she's getting when she buys paints. Um, it's kind of common that paint companies, especially if you're shopping in the student range, will make up fanciful names for their colors. For instance, Winsor & Newton uses the term intense blue instead of phthalo blue. Uh, the best way to know is to look on the tubes and look what pigments are used. And if you have a smartphone, you can go right online, you can search that pigment number and ask and say what color is PG7 or uh, PB15 and it will tell you what it and you can find out what it is. So that might help. Or ordering online where you can sit down and really um, be thoughtful about your purchase and um, make sure you're getting the pigment that you think you're getting. I could say already this arches, the arches paper has more sizing so it wants to encourage blooms more than the uh, aqua bee that I did my sample on. And I typically use this aqua bee for samples just because it's so cheap that I don't feel, it's, but it's a decent quality, but I don't feel bad if I, um, if I uh, make a mistake or waste a piece of paper. It's like 16 bucks for 50 sheets, so I don't worry about it. almost dry though. Wow, what a quiet group. The moderators are getting a lot of the questions. Ah. Because so, a lot of them, we have some new people in today, so they're asking kind of like the... Oh, the regular, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of our regular moderators are, are getting in there. Oh, so. good, good. They don't have to wait then or be missed, so yep, that's good. Yep. I also wanted to let you know that my um, new watercolor course is going to be on launch special for the entire month so if you haven't had a chance to snag it up there's a link in the video description and you can learn more and um, it's an intermediate class so so if you're looking for the beginner class uh, you probably want to check out the first course I launched the new one is an intermediate level uh, so now we're going to go in with um, some of the colors in the vase I really love working on the vase we're still working with a number eight round and um, I'm going to go in and paint some of the stems. So one of the reasons I wanted to have the orange in here is because it makes a beautiful a range of earthy greens when it's mixed with the, um, the phthalo green and the yellow. So I'm going to grab those three colors out in a section here. I will rinse my brush before I go into the green. And I always have two buckets of water, so you have one for um, cleaning your brush, and you got one for getting fresh water out of. It just keeps you from having to run to the sink too often. So starting right underneath the silver band, I'm actually going to put a little bit of color right there. I'm going to pull it down some stems, and I'm going right to about the water line here, or just above the water line. And mason jars have a wide mouth, so you would have, you know, the stems could come in from anywhere. And then underneath the water line, I'm adding a little bit of yellow to my orange, orange plus green mix. And I'm going to drag down some wider distorted stems. And I'm going to grab some that's mostly just yellow and throw in some lighter stems. Sarah Frame, what is the difference between single pigment watercolors and similar co colors that use a blend of two or three pigments? That's the difference right there. Um, a single pigment color is praised because it's usually going to be a little more vibrant. And then when you mix that single pigment color, you're going to be getting a, a more vibrant mix because um, there's fewer pigments. Each time you mix a color, you lower the intensity a little bit. So if you had a single pigment purple, for instance, that would be more intense than a mixed purple. If you had like the single pigment green is, uh, I'll show you on its own, it's super, super vibrant. That's too vibrant for a lot of the green that we need, so we need to mix it with something to tone it down a little bit. But when you get that single pigment, it's color in its pure form. I mean, some single pigments aren't terribly vibrant, like your, your neutral colors, like your iron oxide colors and whatnot. But uh, generally, that's that's the advantage and it's not to say that you can't create beautiful vibrant watercolors if you don't have the single pigments and that's just the it's just a lot easier to keep them bright if you're starting starting with a single pigment color Polly Weidman 
I live in an RV and I'm looking for a portable easel. Any suggestions? Um, if you live in an RV, I would highly suggest one that has storage in it, like a French easel. Um, I mean, granted, it is going to be like a wooden box with legs, but it folds up and um, then you can keep a lot of your supplies right in there. So that would be my suggestion. I got a mix of the orange and yellow and I'm going in and just throwing in some of the petals on my Black Eyed Susans. I typically don't paint with an easel when I'm doing watercolors. Um, so you could also determine whether you really, if having that easel is really important to you, or if you're going to sit at the table in your RV or at a picnic table on a campsite, you can get a smaller, lighter one that uh, will store your supplies and be a tabletop easel. I'm going to clean my brush and grab the yellow on its own. Kind of watery, because I do want my colors to flow. I want this to be really loose. few random petals poking out in there. A lot of, I've had a lot of comments from people saying they RV and they bring their art and craft supplies. Mm. It's a rainy day when you can't go out and do things. Yeah. It's perfect time to relax and do a little painting, I would imagine. Yeah, or if you're traveling the country and, you know, you're seeing sites you've never seen before, mm. what a better way to remember it than... Uh, and to paint it. Now while the petals are still wet, I want to go in and paint the centers because uh, some of the center color will float into the wet petals. I think it gives it a, just a nice look. You can kind of see just some of the uh, or the colors mixed together, spilled together. I just think it's kind of a cool look and wherever it hits a wet petal that's where it's going to spill. So we do need to mix up a color that's a little bit thicker than what we have there. We are going to do that same mix though, but you'll want a paper towel handy so that you can blot your brush. So we're going to start off with, uh, we'll grab a little bit of yellow. Not a lot of water though. Grab some red. Grab some blue. We'll need a little bit more yellow in there, but that purple is kind of where we're, where we're going. Clean my brush before I go to the yellow again though, because that will make a mess of it. Uh, Rebecca Corvo, I got a Jerry's travel set. It does not list any names of the colors, nor am I able to find a color chart online. Any advice on determining colors? Um, is it the, the Lucas Travel watercolor set by any chance? If she could, if you could get her the brand name that she has, I could probably help her out. Wife Duck, typically when I when I was, I taped my paper down, you didn't. What makes the decision to tape or not? Um, size of the paper and weight of the paper. So this is a 140-pound um, paper, and it's about, I have it uh, maybe 6 by 10 inches. It's not very big. So I think that I could handle keeping it flat enough to paint. And plus, I, I tore this down, so I love the deco edges, and I didn't want to have paint marks on the sides because I like how the, the paint just splashes out to the edge. Um, but you could tape it down or even just use bulldog clips or binder clips and clip it to a, um, a piece of foam cord that's roughly the same size as your, as your painting. So it is a personal preference. It's, it's going to buckle a little bit, but the way that I like to display my, um, paintings done in this fashion is I will glue it to a piece of contrasting mat board and then I will mat it. So there's a reveal of about a quarter to half an inch of the, under under color so since i'm going to glue this down i'm going to weight it i'm going to use uh, acid free glue and i'm going to weight it down so it is going to be completely flat because it's going to be adhered to a board a mat board um, so that's why i would do it this way but if you're more comfortable taping it down just go right ahead i also tend to go right to the edges i just have a hard time staying confined into a smaller area so i like having the option i'm going to grab a little bit of the uh, red and blue i, I like the way purp like a brighter purple looks in the centers there, so I am going to mix them up. It's kind of a grape color. And I'm going to add some kind of in the rest of the area. Just a little bit. I might need to go in with a little bit of yellow on its own too because it's awfully dark. 
Ian Jackson, if you paint flat, do you compensate for the loss of gravity moving the paint? Um, no, not really, because I can tip up my paper at any time. Like, if I want to make it run, if I was doing a wash, I could tip it up, or I'd have it on a board, and I could, I could like, put a um, block underneath it or a roll of tape underneath it or something to encourage it to flow. Uh, Baru Siva, when I use salt for effects, instead of drying, it just keeps on leaving water. What to do for that? Keeps on leaving... Well, it does take a, quite a while to dry. So you do have to be kind of patient because if you speed it up with the heat tool, you're not going to get the effect. The The salt should be soaking up the water. You do need it pretty wet, but maybe you actually have it a little too wet or something. That would or be the only... Enough salt? It could be, but she says it's keeping water. I'm thinking maybe she... Or she could have a lot of salt where it's just like pooling the water okay. instead of... And it can't like absorb it. Now I'm going to blot a few of these just because it seems like I do have some really dark areas and I do want some highlights. Just use a fresh part of the paper towel each time and you're going to end up transferring color. All right, for the thistles, we are going to need our credit card scraper. And we're going to start off with um, the... I think I'm going to start off with the green. doesn't really matter what color you start off with. Uh, I've got my mixed green here. And I'm going to go in and just throw in some color, get that teardrop shape kind of blocked in. And then I'm going to take my credit card scraper, I really hope this doesn't go too crazy with the focus, and just use it almost like a pen and scrape out those little, uh, little prickles. Then you're going to go in with some purple, and if your mixed purple is still on your palette that we just used in the centers, you can go right in with that. And I would try to pick, kind of paint it in the thistly fashion. You can scrape more if you need to. Tip of that brush. Go Use a smaller brush if that's not comfortable for you. Uh, the update on the uh, the watercolor palette, the set? Yes. It's the Jerry Q Art 24 Assorted Watercolor Travel Packet. Oh, if I, okay. I have the, I have a Jerry Q Art one, and I actually ended up filling it with my higher, I gave the paints to the kids, and I filled the pans with higher quality paints. Um, that particular set has a lot of filler in it. And the only reason I mention that is that you might, if you are painting, say you're painting this and like your colors aren't as bright or they don't seem to move or you start to see like a snakeskin pattern on your, like in a puddle of paint, you see it almost looks like a snakeskin. That's the, the filler that's in there. Um, so go ahead and paint with it. But uh, I would think about replacing colors with colors that like I've mentioned in tutorials or other watercolorists use so that you can have a tried and true brand of color. Now, she was wondering about the colors, right? Well, how does she know what colors right. are in there? You know, you're going to have a lot of mixes um, and a lot of dyes. What I would do is swatch it out, and then I would um, go find a, a swatch online, like maybe Sennelier or M. Graham or some like tried-and-true brand, and then just match it up as close as you can and label it to those colors so that way when you run out and you're ready to replace and uh, go with a nicer paint, you'll kind of know what colors you've been using a lot and what colors you know, would add value to your, your set. So yeah, that, that's a tough one. It's a great little palette though. I really enjoyed the little palette that those colors came in, but the paints were, the paints are a little chalky, but I absolutely use them. Just, uh, just, I would just find a, another chart that's, you know, from a more trusted, like a trusted brand that would use tried and true pigments just so you can kind of get an idea of what colors you end up using. So you can replace it with the good stuff. Holly Weinman, when using salt, would setting it in the hot sun help? That's fine. That won't that won't that won't negatively affect it. It's more it's more the air, I think, and drying it. The, you know, because I think it moves the water, and then it doesn't give you that nice crystally effect. Add a little bit of yellow into that too. I'm gonna do both of these because I know it's not gonna dry before I get a chance to scrape. Just try not to put your hand in any wet paint when you're doing this. Okay. 
And then we'll do the tops to both of those. Even my finest brush is not as fine as a credit card scraper. Camilla Schlepker, do you have any tips on painting on rough paper? I find it a little more difficult than printing than painting on cold press, especially painting with a little less water. Um, I match the paper to the subject. So I tend to use rough if I'm doing landscapes, seascapes, anything where I want a rough texture or if I'm doing um, like I've done like strawberries on a napkin on like rough paper and it came out really nice because I was able to dry brush the paper uh, the napkin area with a flat brush and it gave me a really great texture but um, but generally I would say because your paint's not going to move quite so much so I would do subjects that have a natural texture to them anyway and I think you'll find you'll have a much easier time working with the paper try it try a landscape definitely something with rocks in it I know some people might, I don't know if they've asked, if anybody's asked or not, but um, these uh, the Yarka paints are the same as the White Knights. They're produced by the same company in Russia. They just have different names for the market that they're going to. So White Knights was marketed to Europe and Yarka St. Saint Petersburg was marketed to the United States. So they're same product, two different trade names to uh, appeal to different markets, but it's the same paint. All right, let's skip down to the vase some more. And I think I'm going to grab a little bit of this uh, kind of mixed gray, really watery. Most of the paint we're using in this project, we're doing really watery because it is so strong. And I'm going to just refine the edge there. The key, I think, to make glass look like glass is to not paint everything one color even though we might know it's a clear glass I made mine definitely a little bit more aqua but even though we know it's a clear glass we're still painting how light re reacts to it we're not really painting the glass I'm going to go in with that mixed turquoise like they call this green emerald green where really it's like a phthalo green um, so I mixed that with my blue earlier so I'm using some of that in here Next, Galore. I use peerless watercolors and cannot get good repeat color results. Any suggestions or better paint options? Hmm. I'm not that versed with peerless. I pretty much would only use it myself if I was working on a small scale project. But um, yeah, just a little goes a long way and they're such strong colors. Probably just it's just practicing getting used to them. If you skip around between a lot of brands, that could actually hinder your your ability to, to work with those. So you might want to just stick to those while you're while you're committed to working with them. I don't think I would skip around unless you're ready to maybe move on to a different paint. Blot a little highlight in the bottom, and that's going to need to dry before we do much else. Now I'm going to switch to the smaller brush, and I'm going to mix up some more dark gray. I think I could probably just take a little bit of phthalo blue and add it to that mix there. Oh, Sarah, I forgot to tell you, I'm chaperoning a field trip next Friday, so we're okay, going to have to... Okay, next Friday off? Off or later. I might uh, I might do a later one. If, okay, if yep. you can do that, awesome. If not, yeah, I, I don't can... Yeah, I think I have any... Just keep me updated. Okay. I can either do later or whatever. Oh, cool. I was thinking maybe even evening. That might be, like, I don't know. You're probably busy on a Friday night, but I me? never am, so... <laughs> I don't have kids, so I some Friday nights I can stay up till ten o'clock. <laughs> Go potty. No, I have to. I have to be good because I've started that new medication, so I can't go out and be too crazy because I got to make sure it's not gonna. Oh yeah. My symptoms aren't hungover symptoms or oh, medication yeah. symptoms, so I have to behave myself for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> well, look at Soba Sarah. Soba Sarah. <laughs> I'm over 75% of the time. Yes, you are. I'm just kidding. I mean, I got a few friends over on a Saturday night. No guarantees because they come to my house. I don't have to drive anywhere. So, <laughs> uh, 
Rebecca Corvo, I know this was mentioned, but in, but I was unable to find. How much do you sell your watercolor cards for at a craft fair? Seven dollars. And I'm lucky if I can get like five dollars for a regular stamped card at a craft fair. Have you ever tried selling your cards at craft I've fairs? I've never sold a card. I've had them out. I haven't sold a single one. So it's I just, such a, just gave up. I was like, people don't want to pay for it. They'd rather go and buy a Hallmark one for $8 that some child in China made and got paid 20 cents than to pay me, a local person, to make them by hand. I so, don't think the ones in, in Hallmark are made by, I don't think they're, I think they're just all fact, like, um, you know, mechanically made. Oh, probably. You know, I they're, say, that's, yeah, they'd they're rather, a tough sell. They are. They're a tough sell unless you're selling them, you know, for 3 or 4 dollars. I sell quite a few at the schoolhouse, but I think because people are going to the schoolhouse to buy gifts right. and they grab the cards. Exactly. Oh, yeah, this way I don't have to run to the Hallmark store or the grocery store to get a to get a card to go with it. I'm just grabbing this mixed orange and throwing a little red into it to make it a little darker. And I'm going to go throw a few uh, shadows on the petals. And this pretty much just kind of divides, separates the petals from one another a little bit. Gives you a little more uh, tightness and form to contrast from the really loose background. Polly Weinman, what is your opinion on Reed's watercolor paints as a starting point? I think they're really good for a starting set, actually. Um, they're, they use names that you will recognize, so you're not going to be like, oh, okay, I... I'm using, you know, fabulous blue, you know, what is fabulous blue? No, they, they call it ultramarine blue. Mm -hmm. They call it Prussian blue. They use, you know, the color. Now, granted, they're going to be mixes and, um, you know, colors that probably aren't as light fast as like maybe a Cotman or Academy or some of the, the student lines that come from as a, you know, from lines that have an artist grade as well. But you're going to know that when you use up your ultramarine blue in the Reeves set, you can go and you can buy a tube of ultramarine blue from a, you know, an art supplier and you're going to get the same color. It might not be the same, you know, it'll be made from nicer pigments probably, but it will be the same essential color. So you're not going to have such a learning curve as you go to branch out. I think though, like that Reeves 24 set's a great idea because you're going to get to see what colors you actually use and what colors you don't use. So you don't end up wasting money buying, you know, 30 tubes of watercolor and finding out you only use eight. I'm going to flick on some of the colors that I have been using throughout the painting. Now, you could do that as you're painting. You don't have to, you know, wait till you're at the end. But you can wait. You totally can wait if you're afraid that maybe you might change your mind and not want to do any spattering. You know, that by waiting, you get you that little bit of a advantage. I think I want to tuck in some mossy green color in the bouquet a little bit. You give a few little, uh, little skinny little leaves underneath the uh, heads of these black eyed Susans. These are like a little bit of a green, um, I don't know, little underhangings. And I can also dab in some yellow, with the hint of maybe some more flowers on the back side. It's like make it a little fuller. I'm feeling like the table needs to be a little bit firmer and fuller because it's gotten really um, kind of washy. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw, throw kind of like a some wet area so I can add some more pigment. I'm going to go into some of this darker color. I didn't use my. Uh, some people had asked me recently to use the Yarka paints. And I hadn't in a while, so I think, oh, that's a good idea. We'll do that. And I've also had people comment saying that they thought that the Yarkas were not as transparent as others. And um, the amount that I have to water them down to get the effects that I want, they're very transparent. But, I mean, you could paint them thickly and have them... They probably are a little opaque if you paint them thickly. Because <clears throat> they come... They, they, uh, they tend to come out of the pan really easily. Also going to flick on some water. I'm 
bring up some spots with some yellow. If you want bigger spatters, you can go with a bigger brush that will just uh, drop more color. So that's another option for you if you feel like you're not getting quite enough color here and there. Uh, L'Oreal Peach, what would be the best watercolor paper to start learning on? Um, I like the Strathmore 400, which has a brown label, and um, it's pretty affordable. I know Jerry's has it. Um, if you have a big box store as well. The big box stores will carry that one. Also Strathmore Wind Power. And the reason I like Strathmore Wind Power is because it has a lot of sizing in it and I feel like you could um, really correct mistakes and lift off mistakes really easily. And the Strathmore 400 behaves much more like a cotton watercolor paper. Uh, and if you get used to that and then you switch over to like an Arches or even the Aqua Bee, which is cotton, um, it would, it would be a really easy transition. It wouldn't be like you're going from, uh, like Strathmore 300 paper seems really, uh, it tends to warp and it doesn't seem to hold your color evenly. And it, and it's about the same price as like the wind power, but I find the wind power just is a lot more durable and it's more consistent. Um, just a better paper to start with. And you get more, I think, I think you get more sheets in a pad of that than the, than the kind of the yellow label. So the wind power has a burgundy label. The 400 series has a red label, um, and the, the 300 series has a yellow label. Just don't get the yellow label stuff. That's I, I feel like that is kind of difficult to work with. Adding a little bit of a highlight with some yellow on some of these some of these tops. I just put a dark with that dark gray color that I'd mixed. Uh, Ian Jackson, has Lindsay used the Schminky student paints? I have, yeah. Um, they're not bad. They're kind of hard to get here, and I think you might end up paying way more than they're worth if you get them here. But uh, a viewer from um, Germany sent me some to to try out, and they're they're really nice. They're I think if you could get the set for like twenty twenty four dollars, like the set of twelve, then it would be a decent buy. But if you have to pay fifty for it, you can go right on line and you can find I like the artist grade schminky sets of 12 if you're you know if you search around a bit you can find that for that price so they're not as strong as the professional line they're very similar actually to the Grumbacher Academy and actually Grumbacher uh, the company that owns Grumbacher in the United States also has distribution rights to schminka so I think it might be the exact same paint Holly Weinman why flip color or water well, I flick water when I want to lighten the areas and encourage lighter blooms or just encourage a modeling effect. And I flick color when I just want to have some more um, spatters of color. I like it. You don't have to do it. It's completely optional. But I also think it gives it a certain looseness and life to the painting. Mystic Sorcha. I constantly have trouble flicking water or paint on my painting without banging my brush against another. I've tried thirstier brushes and lots of water to no end. Hmm. Um, I just find a, a very quick flick of my of my hand does a pretty good job. Uh, they do make spatter tools if you want a really fine mist. Uh, and there's actually a spatter brush it, that Tim Holtz has. It would be in the stamping craft section of your local big box store. And it's got really, really long, um, like rubber, not rubbery, but hard plastic bristles kind of like a cheap glue brush and uh, that's just designed for spatters I think those would all be kind of smaller spatters but if you're having a hard time with it you can try that or you can try a basting brush like the silicone basting brushes from like the dollar store and you probably just got to find a tool that works well for the the technique that you like to use Lainey Davila Lindsay has so much experience with all paints and papers. Does she have to go out and buy everything that comes out? I'm hoping the answer is that they send her samples. I do get a lot of uh, samples and promotional things from different companies, so so don't worry. <laughs> but, I, you know, I've been painting for a long time. It's not like I woke up one day and, you know, got into all of these different medias. Um, I taught, like, 15 years ago, I had a school where I taught, um, like, oil, watercolor, drawing, and then kids mixed media, so... You know, I still have a lot of the stuff left over from that. And then new products that, you know, come out from different companies. A lot of them are the same, 
you know, it was just a different, not different packaging, but it's like a different version of this watercolor or that watercolor. So it's not, you definitely don't have to go out and get everything. And a lot of the newer uh, products do come to me from companies that are looking for a little exposure or they're sponsoring videos. So, or if people ask me to review something, I might uh, reach out to a company and see if they have a, a sample they can send. I don't ask for samples just for my own, <laughs> my own greediness. It's if, if somebody asks. You're just so fabulous and so popular <laughs> that they just send you the samples. I don't. Yeah. Sometimes, a lot of times, though, I turn them down because, um, because it just gets to be too much, and there's. It seems like there's this, if, if, if somebody hasn't asked me for a review for it, then I usually turn them down. Otherwise, we'd need a bigger house. <laughs> you need a house just for... This is my art supply house. <laughs> this is my art house. Literally, just art. All of my art things. I feel like that needs a little bit more orange in it. And I switched to a smaller brush because I just want to add little accents at this point. I find loose paintings hard to replicate because I, I look at, I'm looking at the reference photo. I'm looking at my painting that I did uh, this morning and last night. And it's, it can be, it's hard to replicate a loose painting because so much of it is dependent on how your water goes on the paper that you're using and, it's, it's definitely a much more intuitive process than painting realistically because instead of saying I want to paint this just like this one, I'm saying I, what's going to work good on this picture like with this blob of color here, I want to, you know, make that more pronounced so it's every, everybody's painting is going to be completely different from this lesson. It'd be really cool to see them and uh, see how everyone's turns out. So if you do finish it, um, one of our uh, folks here in the chat, one of our moderators has set up a Facebook group called Live Show Frugalities. And or is it frugalities or frugalites? I pronounce it frugalite. It's That's probably, probably how like it is. Tomato, tomato. Well, the, he's a great group, and um, yes, we've had several people showing interest. So he's gonna post the link to that on Facebook awesome. at the end of this, so people who want to join can go join. Yes, because I love here. So I thought I'd be all like sneaky, and I would just sneak into that group, and I would just peek. And no, he totally outed me as soon as I joined the group. Lindsay's here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I was gonna be all stealthy and just spy on you guys. <laughs> Delicy. And a little, some little sparks of just a yellow on its own. Now this is a cadmium yellow. Cadmium colors are very opaque. So it doesn't matter what brand that you get a cadmium yellow in. As long as it's not a hue, it's real cadmium. One of the qualities of cadmium is that it's opaque. Even though, you know, you're in a transparent watercolor line, it's still going to be a, a fairly opaque color. It's, it's good to know if you're playing. So when you're planning a... Um, a painting, you know, your opaque colors are also a little bit more likely to turn to mud if you're not careful. And um, they will, when you mix them with other things, they are going to make the other things a little bit more opaque too. So the more you know about your pigments and what you're painting with, the better off you'll be. Holly Weinman, have you used the brushes, uh, brushes by Cinnamon Cooney? If so, what is your take on them? No, I haven't. I, they're probably mostly acrylic brushes. Um, actually, she was going to send me some, but that was that hurricane and stuff, so. Um, but I'm sure if Cinnamon says they're good, she wouldn't, she wouldn't put her name on something that was junky, I'm sure. But I'm not a, I don't paint acrylics very often. Alright, now I need some more shadows in the vase, and then I'm going to show you a product called Bleed Proof White, which can be very handy for, um, if you want to have some lights, some whites in your painting, but you don't want to mess with masking fluid or you're, maybe you're painting loose and you didn't um, anticipate that you were going to want some light areas, it's a, it's a fun product. Um, it's really wonderful if you do illustration because it lets you uh, kind of block out some areas. And uh, that's just, it's just kind of neat. I've been finding enjoyment using it lately and I think you guys might too. But if you don't have it, you could always use like a, a white acrylic. Or you could use a white gouache, or you could use a white watercolor. White watercolor is not going to be very opaque, though. But um, you use what you have. If it's a product that you think you might find value in, then I've linked in the video description. Or you can add it to your Christmas wish list. I'm adding a little bit more of that brighter blue in there. I feel like it needs, it needs a little pop of 
something. And now I'm gonna do a little bit more speckling. So when I want a bigger speckle, I gotta be careful because my computer's right in front of me. <laughs> you thought autofocusing was our, our biggest <laughs> problem today. <laughs> so you want really, really wet, um, wet paint and you want a, a juicier brush. So see, you get bigger speckles when you have a bigger brush. You'll get littler speckles with, like a, with a stiffer brush or a smaller brush. If I used like this brush here, I'd get super, I'd get huge splats, but it would go, it would probably drown my computer. So I'm not going to do that, but just give you an idea anyway. And if you speckle, speckle some color on and you change your mind, you can always um, blot it and really reduce how much you have there. I'll show you that in a second. So if I decided I didn't want so much, you just take a relatively dry paper towel and blot, and you'll just leave like a little bit of a stain. All right, I am gonna dry this. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask, and then we'll come back and I'll show you that bleed proof white. Uh, Ian Jackson, have you used acrylic gouache? Yes, I have. I actually, it's funny because I'm not crazy about painting with acrylics, but I really enjoy painting with acrylic gouache. Um, I think it's, I think I like the finish of it. It's got a very soft velvety matte finish and I don't like the finish of traditional acrylic paints where it's got that kind of plastic look. I think it just, I think that's what turns me off with acrylics, not to mention how quickly it dries, but it just has this look that, that I don't like. It's a, just the sheen of it or something, but acrylic, but uh, acrylic gouache has that velvety matte finish that's really nice and it's also really nice for mixed media workers because you can go over it with colored pencils and it has a little tooth to grab other media jordan sinclair what are some good alternatives to the pads um well if different companies are going to have different um different versions but if you want an opaque yellow or an opaque um orange or red like a cadmium you can always get uh, cadmium hue in a gouache line like the Schmincke gouache or um, there's a couple brands that make a light fast gouache. Schmincke is one of them and I can't remember the other one but uh, if you want to substitute you can do that. Most yellows do tend to have a little bit of opacity anyway so just by it being yellow it does tend to be more opaque. Like for a uh, cad red there's uh, vermilion, um, pyrrole red is, has a little bit of opacity, pyrrole scarlet. Just when you're when you're purchasing a paint on the tube, it should tell you whether it's opaque, semi-opaque, or transparent. And uh, if it's non-staining and, and uh, opaque or semi-opaque, it's going to be pretty opaque. Okay. Uh, now, when I use Bleed Proof White, I tend to use a synthetic brush. It doesn't hold a lot of water. This is this is a, a gouache, so it will come out of your brush. I'm just cleaning my brush and make sure I make sure I don't have any residue color on there. But I do dry it. You could stir it up if you haven't used it in a while because it can get pretty thick in the jar. And um, a lot of times I'll put a little bit out on my palette so I don't uh, contaminate. And a little goes a long way. So this jar could probably last you 10 years. Um, and I, if it got thick, you could just add a little water to it. Um, I'm going to go in and just kind of get some highlights on the glass. And it's very opaque. You can thin it down if you want, like if you want some translucent glazing. It will look a little more subtle as it dries. I know it looks kind of like crazy bright at the moment. But I, I and think of it kind of like, you know, you're putting, you know, sprinkles on a cupcake. You know, it's your final, um, your final steps. You don't want to go overboard because this is just accenting. Like if I want to do, like let's say that that part right there, I want to make that a little bit more transparent so I'm getting kind of just like a cast reflection. I would clean my brush off, pull off any extra water, and then I would just work it back and forth and spread out that pigment. And then you get that soft um, cast reflected highlight. And I'm going to do that up there because we have the strong reflection there. So I'm going to put a cast one up there. So I'm going to go in. And I like to go in and put the color down and then I like to smooth it out lighter, but you can mix it with water to begin with if you want to. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll spray some water on my palette and then just dip in that so I don't end up with too much. So I had a little, some little droplets over there, so I just dipped into that. 
This is by the Dr. P.H. Martin Company. They make um, high quality inks. And uh, you can find all of those at Jerry's as well. I think their stuff is definitely more geared to like the, the design market, like a graphic design market versus fine art, but you certainly can use them for fine art. If you want to highlight any of the rims on the little uh, metal rim up here, I forgot what you call those things. The tops of a mason jar that has the separate, oh, the bands, the bands. And you can even highlight some of the petals if you want to, but I'm gonna, I would switch to a round brush for that. Like if you've kind of felt like you've gotten a little lost, this isn't designed for mixing, but um, there's no reason why you can't mix. You could also go over this if you wanted to with watercolor. So if you wanna, in fact, I think I probably would mix it in a little bit or add a little water to it just so it's not too bold because I don't want to have shiny flowers. I want my flowers to look a little more velvety. This can help give you some structure if you've lost, um, if you've lost the form. But I just find it's a lot more effective than going in with like a white watercolor. I find a white watercolor might be effective for mixing if you're trying to like get a skin tone and you've you just can't get that creaminess that you want. But um, I really find more white white watercolor to be more useless than anything. Something like uh, the bleed proof white just has a little bit more oomph to it. Now I'm just going on with just some cad yellow, going right over those highlights so that they don't appear shiny. Heather Greensmith, gouache can be used if you're going to put it in a competition. Um, it depends if it, it, it depends if it's a transparent watercolor, like a strict one or not. Michael Ann, could you use just, could you just use the white watercolor for highlights? Um, white watercolor generally is not potent enough or opaque enough to, to give you a highlight. You can try it, but it, it's, it does kind of want to dissolve into your previous layers, I find. And it's just not very transparent. White gel pen works fantastic for little slivers of highlight. Of course, you know, like, um, I can't remember who just left the comment. It's not a traditional product. It wouldn't, but this isn't going to a competition. This isn't fine art. This is fun art. And I'll use gel pen if I feel like it. <laughs> but you can use whatever is, you know, whatever it helps you meet your artistic goals. Absolutely. I'm not poking fun at, um at pure watercolor. I used to be very fussy about pure watercolor, keeping it pure watercolor. And then I was like, then I stepped over to the dark side. And I'm like, whew, <laughs> the other half knows how to live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to give a hint of the kind of the ball logo on here and start of the word Mason, because that's usually what it says on the bottom of these. any other little accents you want to put in there with a gel pen you are more than welcome to do and I think I'm just gonna give it a little bit oh this looks a little I think I want to refine that a little bit with my my bleed proof white I got that a little choppy looking so just a little higher highlight there I think that's all right. I do want a little bit more of a shadow underneath, so I'm going to go in. I still am going to use my number eight. I think I don't think it would hold enough water to use my smaller one. And I'm grabbing some one of those, either one of the grays you made or one of the purples you made. You want something kind of crisp and just right underneath the jar to separate it from the table. I'll pull it straight out. If you want to add any of that um, turquoisey color and you can because it would be reflected on the table as well. And even a little bit of yellow can be added in there. 
add a little sunshine a little more yellow into the vase too and maybe spatter on a little more yellow and I think I'm gonna call this done we have any other questions before we wrap up today oh, I think we're caught up all right well let's uh, I mentioned on my blog that we would compare between the cheap yeah. and expensive paper because um, I hear so many artists poo-poo different papers and I get really annoyed with like kind of the um kind of the attitudes out there so this was done on aqua v paper which was like 50 sheets for 16 bucks uh it's 140 pound 100 percent cotton six by nine and this was done on a piece of arches which is uh i think probably for a 22 by 30 inch sheet it's about six bucks so you'd probably get about eight of those from one so um Math, I don't know. Do you know what per sheet price that would be? Like if you I, had... I honestly, I wasn't, I didn't, okay. I, I, it went in my right ear and <clears throat> fell right out of my left. I didn't absorb it. If anyone has a calculator, can you divide 50 by 16, no, it's $16 into 50 and then divide 8 into 6. Maybe they cost the same. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Anybody got math? <laughs> I, well, we're getting caught up here. Uh, so, Dom, Dominique says hello. She's back on. Oh, she have a baby? She did. Oh, congratulations, yes. Dominique. Oh, wonderful. Did she have a boy or a girl? She had a boy named AJ. He's got to go oh. on for heart surgery next week. Oh, my goodness. Oh. He's got a, I think she said a valve that they got to go in and help him expand it oh but my he's goodness. good other oh, otherwise good, good, good. i've seen some pictures of him on the Aww. facebook and he is stinking adorable oh best of luck two it's a two dollar difference a two dollar difference between per her wow okay so yeah, there, I actually like the one I did in the cheap paper better, but I think part of that might be because I started off, I made the real big wet mess uh, last night and then I left it and I came back this morning to put in the details. And I always find that the painting that I let sit overnight or for a few hours between starting and finishing, I like a little bit better. Um, but I think that probably the colors appeared maybe a little slightly brighter on the arches because it has more sizing. Um, also the arches has a little bit more texture to it. But um, I think this is definitely the type of painting you could do on whatever paper you have. So don't let your, you know, a lack of expensive supplies stop you. I think you could probably even do this in an art journal, uh, mixed media paper, anything like that. Um, you know, your colors would be dull if you did it on cardstock, but you certainly could try it if, you know, that's all you had on hand. Because it's not the supplies that makes you an artist, it's the fact that you make art. Any more questions before we sign off? We're all caught up. Okay, wonderful. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate all the patience with the autofocusing issues. And um, thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Jerry's Artorama, if you need any art supplies. And um, I have all the information on my new class in the video description. You can click that link and watch the promo. And if you decide that you want to pick it up, you get a 50% off discount. So thank you so much. Until next time, happy crafting.